Hello everyone and welcome to our module on pelvic inflammatory disease. Pelvic inflammatory disease refers to infection of the upper genital tract. This means infection of the uterus, fallopian tubes, or the ovaries. In the vagina, as part of the normal vaginal flora, there are lots of pathogenic bacteria. But usually the upper genital tract remains sterile and that's because it's protected by the cervical canal. But if anything disrupts this barrier of the cervical canal, then all those bacteria in the vagina can ascend and that's what causes pelvic inflammatory disease. And what usually causes disruption of the cervical barrier is a cervical infection. The most common causes of cervical infection that lead to pelvic inflammatory disease are infection with either Neisseria gonorrhea or Chlamydia trachomatis. These are both common sexually transmitted infections. They can cause cervicitis and that can potentially lead to pelvic inflammatory disease. And so because gonorrhea and chlamydia are common infections and because they can lead to PID, all sexually active women who are under age 25 should have annual screening for infection with gonorrhea and chlamydia along with a pap test. We also screen women who are older than age 25 if they're sexually active and they're at risk for infection. Besides gonorrhea and chlamydia, some other potential causes of pelvic inflammatory disease are mycoplasma genitalium, another less common cause, and there are also many other pathogens, but the two main causes are gonorrhea and chlamydia. The risk factors for pelvic inflammatory disease all have to do with the risk of developing infection with gonorrhea or chlamydia. So this includes sexual activity, especially with multiple partners, a prior sexually transmitted infection or prior PID are risk factors, lack of barrier protection is a risk factor, and then you should be aware that pelvic inflammatory disease is very rare during pregnancy that's because women who are pregnant have a mucus plug which forms in the cervical canal and this makes pelvic inflammatory disease very uncommon. Next let's talk about the clinical features of pelvic inflammatory disease. First of all it can cause lower abdominal or pelvic pain. A classic finding on physical exam is cervical motion tenderness. When you move the cervix that moves the uterus and the fallopian tubes and if there's infection this will be very painful. The classic finding is called the chandelier sign. This refers to so much pain when you move the cervix that the woman wants to jump up and grab the chandelier on the ceiling. There can also be uterine or adnexal tenderness. Sometimes there is purulent cervical discharge. Women can report cervical spotting or bleeding from the infection. And then in some but not all cases, there can be systemic symptoms, symptoms like fevers and chills and leukocytosis. And then lastly, some women with pelvic inflammatory disease develop right upper quadrant pain and this is caused by perihepatitis. Perihepatitis is also called the Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. This refers to inflammation of the liver capsule and it's caused by spread of the infection out of the pelvis and into the capsule surrounding the liver. When this happens, right upper quadrant pain can develop. Usually the pain is pleuritic, which means it's worse with inspiration and that's because the diaphragm, when it contracts, can irritate the liver capsule. The pain can also radiate to the shoulder. It's common for right upper quadrant pain related to liver disease to do this. The treatment is with antibiotics the same as for PID, which we'll talk about shortly. So in a woman who has pelvic inflammatory disease with right upper quadrant pain, you don't need to do any special testing. You can simply treat the PID. The definitive diagnosis, however, is made through laparoscopy. This isn't usually necessary. But if you do this, what you will see are adhesions from the capsule of the liver. This is a picture of what they look like on the screen here. These are described as violin string adhesions. Pelvic inflammatory disease is a clinical diagnosis. It's made in women who have pelvic or lower abdominal pain plus cervical motion tenderness or uterine or adnexal tenderness. If you have these findings, you can make the diagnosis and begin treatment with antibiotics, which we'll talk about in a minute. Imaging is not required for the diagnosis of PID. Having said that, however, women who have severe disease always get a transvaginal ultrasound. The definition of severe disease is a high fever, nausea and vomiting, or severe pain, or in women who are sick enough to be hospitalized. These women always get a transvaginal ultrasound. The reason is not to make the diagnosis of pelvic inflammatory disease. It's because you need to exclude a tubo-ovarian abscess, which has special therapy. So a tubo-ovarian abscess is a complication of PID. It refers to an inflammatory mass in the fallopian tubes or sometimes around the ovary. It has the same clinical features as PID. There can be tenderness and fever and leukocytosis, but it has special risks associated with it because it can rupture and this can lead to peritonitis, which can be life-threatening. And the diagnosis is made by transvaginal ultrasound and it's because of the risk of a tubo ovarian abscess that all women with severe features of PID always get a transvaginal ultrasound. 
If you identify a tubo ovarian abscess by ultrasound, the management involves antibiotics, the same drugs that are used for PID, which we'll talk about shortly. About 70% of women with a tubo ovarian abscess improve on antibiotics alone. But for women who don't improve, they often need image-guided drainage. You can use imaging with CT scans or ultrasound to identify the abscess and drain it, or sometimes laparotomy is required. And so because a tubo ovarian abscess can require special interventions like this, you always want to know about it up front in a woman with severe features of PID. You may begin treating her with antibiotics, but if she doesn't get better, one of these procedures may be indicated. So now let's talk about the management of pelvic inflammatory disease. First of all, you should know that milder cases can be treated as an outpatient. Not all women with this disorder have to be hospitalized. Some of the commonly used hospitalization criteria, however, are shown on this slide. Some of these are a high fever, nausea and vomiting, severe pain. Any woman with a tubo ovarian abscess is usually hospitalized. And as I said, it's rare for pelvic inflammatory disease to occur in pregnancy, but when it does, those women are always hospitalized. The treatment is with antibiotics. Usually it's a cephalosporin plus doxycycline. Remember, this is a polymicrobial infection. It's not just an infection with gonorrhea or chlamydia. It's an infection with many of the vaginal flora bacteria that have ascended into the upper genital tract. So you have to give broad coverage. So you need to cover gram positives, gram negatives, and also anaerobes. There are many regimens that can be used in the inpatient setting. A classic regimen is cefoxitin IV plus doxycycline PO. Some people call this the foxy-doxy regimen for treatment of PID. In the outpatient setting, people commonly give an intramuscular dose of ceftriaxone plus oral doxycycline. And then for the long term, the major complications of pelvic inflammatory disease all have to do with the fact that the infection, after it resolves, can leave behind scarring and adhesions, especially in the uterus or fallopian tubes. When this happens, the egg can't travel normally through the fallopian tubes, and implantation is also often impaired. So many women who have a history of pelvic inflammatory disease have problems with infertility. Also, when pregnancy does occur, there's a higher risk of an ectopic pregnancy because the fertilized egg has trouble moving through the fallopian tubes and implanting in the uterus. And that concludes our module on pelvic inflammatory disease.